Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Before we get started, I want to call out a few features that will be really helpful for you throughout the presentation. The first is in the top right corner of your screen. It's our chat area. So I want to encourage you all to use this as much as possible throughout the presentation. And I'm actually going to make sure you're all awake and listening right now. If you want to pop into the chat and tell me where you are tuning in from so we can see where our audience is coming from, go ahead right now and let us know. That would be really helpful. And if you want to say uh, maybe what your title is, your organization, go for it. Anything you want to do to introduce yourself to the group. All right, it looks like everyone is using the chat and you know where it's located, woohoo. Perfect. Um, the other area we have is the Q&A area. This is where you're going to put your questions for the panel. And I also want to encourage you all to use the question and answer area throughout the uh, presentation. We're just going to be chatting today. So we want to be able to answer your questions in real time based on the topics we're discuss discussing. So if you have a question for any of our panelists, go ahead in that Q&A area and put in a question and we'll try to get to it during the presentation. If not, we'll get to it at the end. All the questions will be answered. Uh, the next area is the poll um, feature, and we're going to have a poll at the start of the presentation that I'll call out after our introductions. And finally, our survey, which we would very much like for you to take at the end of the presentation to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. And of course, we use this to improve our future programs for you all, so make sure you give us your feedback. And with that, I'm going to uh, do some introductions of our panel today. I'm going to start with myself since I'm on screen right now. I am Kelly Kopeck, and I am a product marketer on the Cvent team. And I specialize in our solutions that we like to call our exchange solutions. Um, if you were on a little early, you saw some of those videos at the beginning. And they're really our solutions that connect event organizers with hotels and venues and suppliers of all kinds. So we have a venue sourcing solution, a vendor sourcing solution. Uh, we have room block management technology and event diagramming technology that accomplishes this. Uh, and I am going to be the host for today and I'm going to bring in our panel of experts that will be joining us. First is Kelly McDonald. Welcome to the screen, Kelly. Mm -hmm. And if you could uh, let the audience know a little bit about your role at Wells Fargo and anything else you want to share. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. And hello, everyone. Again, I am Kelly McDonald. I am a senior event sourcing consultant at Wells Fargo. I sit on the meetings and events team, and we handle about 1,200 events, 1,200 plus contracts a year. We handle sourcing negotiating contracting for all of our uh, Wells Fargo meetings from small board meetings to bigger conferences and summits. So I'm happy to be here and excited to join the panel. Thank you. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Next, I'll bring in Alyssa Petty, who is joining us um, from IHG Hotels and Resorts. Alyssa, thank you for joining us. Uh, let everyone know who you are and what you do. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Alyssa Petty. I'm the director of our global sales strategy team for IHG Hotels and Resorts, uh, which is one of the largest hotel companies. Uh, we have over 6,000 hotels representing different brands, um, many of whom play really well in the meetings and events space from Holiday Inn and Crown Plaza hotels to Kimpton, Intercontinental and Six Senses. So I've been with IHG for nearly 12 years. I started on property uh, with our Kimpton hotels in Philadelphia. And I've been a part of the global sales team here for six years. Amazing. Thanks for joining us, Alyssa. And finally, we have Charlene Smith. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm so happy that we can see you, Charlene, oh. because she just got a new camera set up and it didn't start working until uh, seconds before our stream. <laughs> it's, it's crooked. It's crooked, too. But I promise that I am sitting up straight and we'll try to improve as we go along. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you and we can see you. So thank you okay. for joining us, I'm Charlene. Uh, let us know a little bit about yourself. Introducing myself. Your okay, introducing myself. Um, I am the America's Regional Manager for Global Events at Cisco Systems. I've been at Cisco 16 years and I oversee an internal bureau team who does soup to nuts for events as well as um, a second hat that I wear is to oversee the global strategic meetings management program that we have 
and where we utilize heavily Cvent for all of our uh, sourcing and um, uh, efforts in that area. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today, we are going to be uh, unfiltered. We're just going to have a conversation about some of those trending topics. And the idea for the conversation today came from a lot of the feedback that um, at CVET we were hearing from planners and, and hotels in our community and through different programs like this. And there are still a lot of pain points when it comes to the venue sourcing process in particular, and some of um, what goes into collaborating with venues on the event organizer side. So we wanted to share um, some expert advice from our panel and, and get your questions answered, really. And um, I took to our CVent community, which is where a lot of our uh, our customers like to engage and get additional information. And I asked them to submit questions specifically for this panel. Uh, so we would have additional content and questions to answer throughout. So uh, we'll be answering those questions live today too. I'm, and I, I mentioned we had a poll. So I'm gonna start with this poll before we get into the conversation. So if you all could click on the poll icon, I am going to um, read out the poll and then hopefully you all can answer as I'm reading it. What topic could you use some advice on to improve your event programs? Uh, the choices are RFP tips to stand out to venues, contracting and negotiation best practices, managing room box efficiently with hotels, diagramming and collaborating on event space. Seeing the responses come in, there are nearly 200 attendees live today. So go ahead, keep on putting in your answers. And I had a hunch that contracting and negotiation were going to be the number one. <laughs> yep. Okay. So it looks like right now contracting and negotiation is the clear favorite and we are going to get to that. I am going to start the conversation with the RFP tips uh, section and, and some advice there and just get a little bit about what our panel are experiencing when it comes to the RFP process. So I'm going to start with Charlene. I'm wondering what type of events are you sourcing for and what do your lead times look like right now at Cisco? Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Kelly. We are sourcing everything. I mean, we have everything from flagship events for 20,000 people, uh, you know, to our board of directors meeting or our executive team meeting. So we handle all of that per policy that comes to us. We're doing about 43, 4,400 RFPs a year. We have a little over 23,000 events. So uh, those that do require that, um, uh, we, we send out RFPs uh, for that. And, and I think the key to our success is the speed at which we have to move at Cisco. And I think this is probably replicated at uh, more companies uh, in corporate America where we have to go back with best and final in 48 hours. That's how quickly the technology community works. Um, and we have to keep up and we have to um, uh, make sure our event owners are moving forward with getting those customers to the events. So we'll do um, uh, a best and final back, but we also work very closely with our NSOs, our GSOs, and we have uh, pre-negotiated contract templates. So that's what helps us push forward. There is some negotiation that happens in there, um, but we don't leave a lot of time for it, honestly. So I, I think that's what pushes us forward. That's great. And I'll move to you, Kelly. What about you? What kind of events are you working on and what are those lead times? Uh, like Charlene, we are doing everything from small catering only pieces of business to larger, you know, group room blocks and banquets and catering and offsite. So we're doing the gamut there as far as sourcing goes. Our lead times, you know, I wish they were longer, but I would say we're still, you know, some of them, I have an important meeting that's happening in April that I just got yesterday. So that's a meeting for a hundred and it's catering only, but that's a very quick turn for us. So we'd like it to be longer, but I would say we're still kind of in that three to six month range. Now we are we are starting to see longer lead times, which we greatly appreciate on the sourcing and contracting team at Wells. We work with our event planners very closely and our business partners. So we are in just 
encouraging all the time, please give us more time, please give us more time. So it's the gamut as far as size and the lead time varies, but I do see it improving, which is great news for I think everyone on this call to give us a bit more time. Follow up to that, Kelly, because you mentioned mm -hmm. size being a variable. Is mm -hmm. our, So you're saying that the RFP process may be a little bit different based on maybe the size or the type of event? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the process is the same. We're still using the Cvent tool to source all of our meetings and events. It's just, you know, the smaller ones we can usually turn much quicker because we're not, yeah. it's not, it's an easier scope, right, that we're dealing with. So I think that would be the difference. Those tend to be a bit more short term, but I'm surprised often by how many times our mid-size larger groups will come in with not much lead time or, you know, can only be a Tuesday, Wednesday in the fall in you know, the top destination that you can think of. So <laughs> we don't always get that flexibility that we'd like to see. And coming from a former hotel salesperson for about eight years, I, I understand the trouble that Alyssa and her team have to deal with when it comes to, you know, our, our big demands and maybe not as much flexibility as we'd like. For sure. And then uh, getting to the topic of responses from hotels and venues, it, mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, the, the lead times aren't um, always ideal, but you're doing what you can to make that work. Are there challenges then um, from Kelly for you and the Wells Fargo sites in getting the responses um, that you need within what you require the time frame? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, you know, we have a bit more time than Charlene's team does to get, you know, venues and suggestions out to our business partners. We usually like to give at least a three day um, business days time for our partners to respond three to five. It depends on when that event date is. We do have some, you know, wiggle room there. And I am in enthusiastically pleased with the responses I'm getting from properties. It is I would say sometimes I do have to follow up with properties when that deadline has come or it's maybe that day I'll send a reminder, hey, this is re you know happening today. Can you submit a proposal? As Charlene said, I involve our GSOs whenever I need and they're all fabulous to help push things along because I do understand the amount of volume that hotels are getting in. And sometimes you just need to send that little extra push like, hey, can you get it back to me? Mm -hmm. In the event that we do have to make that extra reach out, I. I'm getting responses, even if it's a turn down, which is fine, right? We just have to know what it is. So I'm very pleased with the hotel turn time. Oftentimes they're getting me proposals before the deadline I even put in. That's great. And then Charlene, mm -hmm. what about you? What are, um, what's your experience with response times and how are you navigating if there are any challenges? Right, right. You know, I took a look at this last week and the difference from our fiscal year last year to this year, uh, last year, we were about a 50 day cycle. And that's from when we send out the RFP through negotiations through contracting. Um, and we had 30% declined by hotels, which is very frustrating because that pushes us into a second round, a third round until we can find viable options for our event owners. And I had a 2% no response, which I, I still can't understand. But um, so we're happy to say that our cycle time uh, and our declines are down. Cycle time being down is better for our resource uh, model, right? Uh, the quicker we can push through, the better off we are as a team. But we're running right about 18% decline with a 1% no response. So I think businesses up, hotels are more responsive. They're, they've uh, uh, filled out their staff again. Uh, so the staff is able to respond quickly. And that's definitely what we need. The stats, the stat you mentioned on the, uh, I think it was 50 days, you said was um, the average at Cisco. That's interesting because it uh, it's about the same when we looked at the stats across all planners using the C-Event supplier network. So that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of planners. Mm -hmm. It's about 50 days from when a uh, planner would submit an RFP to when they will actually award it. Uh, so that it's interesting that you're seeing similar timeframes and then some more stats of, you know, what we look at here at Cvent coming from our data through our venue sourcing platform uh, across all events that are happening uh, through our system. Uh, RFPs are on average being sent to 11 venues per one RFP across eight brands 
And then when it comes to responses of those 11 venues, five will bid, four will turn down, and two will not respond. So it, it's just very interesting looking and tracking the stats because what we found is uh, event organizers are having to add more venues to their RFP to get the responses that, that they need. Uh, but like, like you are experiencing, Charlene, we're seeing more hotels bid and more respond than in the previous year or two. So that's great. And I will segue then to bring Alyssa into the conversation um, and get that hotel perspective. And I, I think we all can acknowledge from Kelly and Charlene's responses that group business is up and it continues to grow for most organizations. So uh, Alyssa, how are uh, you navigating that from IHG's, IHG standpoint in terms of um, keeping up with the business coming in? Yeah, absolutely. And it makes my hotel your heart happy to hear Kelly and Charlene um, express their satisfaction with the speed of response from the RFP process. I also am confused by the the not response and, and for any of my IHG hotels that are on the phone here. Um, let's hope that we're not on that list. Um, but yeah, it is. There's a lot coming in. And as Kelly mentioned, sometimes that lack of flexibility can make it challenging for our hotels to come back with a compelling bid. And what we always try to stress is to respond before the deadline, but respond with an accurate and a compelling quote as well. And, and sometimes those things take time. Um, I often say within my team, right, we can do things right or we can do them quick. Sometimes it's both, but we wanna make sure that we're able to exceed expectations. And if you're not able to accommodate a piece of business, turn it down and, and explain why. And if there's alternate dates that are available, that of course should always be a, a consideration as well. So that if Charlene or Kelly or any of the other event planners get into a scenario where they've got all declines for a particular event or set of dates or, or program, they'll know that there are other options that are available and that can make your hotel more attractive as they're reconsidering or uh, coaching their stakeholders on how to take next steps. Is there any advice you would give to the event organizers on the line to make their RFP stand out or um, make it so business is prioritized on the hotel side? Yeah, that's a great question. I think my piece of advice would be to give as much information as you can. Um, it slows down everyone's process if we get dates and um, room needs, but not much more context on why it's important or what else the team is doing or the things that are really critical to either the event organizer or the attendees. And oftentimes our hotels want to make those connections with the event planners. They want to learn more and they want to be able to position their property in the best possible way if it's a great fit for this business. And I'm sure that back and forth between the hotel and the event organizer adds time to the process. It can clog up your inbox, especially if you're sourcing to you know, 11 or 12 different properties at the same time. And so as much information as you can provide from the get-go, either through the RFP or through your, your global salesperson, that'll help our hotels to get you the best possible response as quickly as they can. Yeah, and I just wanna add something to Alyssa's point there for the hotels on the line. I would like to tell you that I know what's going on in your city at any given time, but I don't all the time. And so it may be a huge city wide that you're like, how could they not know what's going on? Feel free to add that into the RFP because I did just recently had one that had to be in Miami. It had to be the certain date. And I got all these turndowns. There's only one property that said, hey, did you know Formula One is here over your date? I said, I did not know that. And so my group that was not flexible was certainly then flexible. So that is yeah. helpful information and we do appreciate it. Very good point. And, and I would add, this is where we are very pleased and dependent on CVET for allowing us to give you all of that information, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go way back to when we used to do this in the mail or on a fax machine, right? And it's so easy to give you more information than you need. And that, uh, you know, is, is wonderful. And it also tracks inside, inside the tool as well. So we're able to look at year over year um, mm -hmm. I, I think I mentioned um, earlier in our conversation uh, earlier last week that we sometimes feel it's a pretty baby contest and we don't know what the pretty baby is. You know, is it us? Is it uh, Wells Fargo? You know, who's going to get uh, the nod for that business? But um, I think giving you as much information as possible helps you through that. For sure. 
Thanks for reminding me of the fax machine, Charlene. That was, I remember getting contracts to those. <laughs> oh my gosh, crazy times those were. <laughs> uh, great conversation, ladies. And I am going to move on to the more of the unfiltered uh, part of the conversation and go to some of the questions that were submitted from um, some of our C event customers who submitted in the community channel. And the first, and I, I don't know if she's on the line, but if she is, hi, Julie Michelle. Um, Julie Michelle from, uh, she's a meetings manager at Amex GBT. She had a couple of questions and I'm gonna uh, pass this over to Alyssa because they're more so getting the hotel perspective. And I wanna point out, these aren't specific to IHG. It's not a concern <laughs> that she had with IHG, just wanted the hotel perspective um, to answer these questions. So the first question is, how much emphasis do you put into rooming requests? It often feels like they aren't looked at until the person arrives at the front desk and then someone finds something that best fits the request at that time. That's a great question. And I can absolutely see how that's a pain point. I think all of us, um, whether you're on the hotel side, the event planner side, we operate in these two worlds, right? There's the perfect world scenario where everything that we've planned goes exactly as expected. And then there's the curveball world, which I'm sure we all spend more time in than we would like to. And I think rooming lists often fall into to one of these things. I'm certain that our event planners are providing rooming lists. I'm certain that our hotels are taking a look at them, assigning rooms, you know, giving upgrades as you've specified. And then there's inevitably a scenario where someone's flight is canceled or they arrive early or the event planner thought that they wanted a high floor room, but they actually show up and they want a low floor room. So there's that, there's that pivot moment that happens at the front desk often. So I, I know our hotel teams and our conference service managers and our front desk teams all work through to prioritize and to make everyone as happy as they possibly can. And they do their best to sort of roll with those outliers as well. Great answer. I'm going to move into the next question that Julie Michelle submitted. When comparing two comparable RFPs, does RevPAR always trump history? We're having trouble with hotels giving us any motivation for repeat business. They are just quoting a take it or leave it rate. It feels like loyalty is meaningless. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Alyssa, but I think that maybe Charlene and Kelly have some perspective too in terms of loyalty and repeat business with hotels. But I'll start with you, Alyssa. Yeah, absolutely. So there definitely is a, a financial aspect to any offer that the hotel is making for your program in the same way that that you have a budget or an allocated amount of funding that you're able to spend on that event as well. Um, and those things are usually pretty concrete on both sides of the house. Um, in my perspective, what I think loyalty buys you is one, the ability to have a conversation, right? If you've worked with a hotel partner or if a hotel has worked with an event planner before, you're able to have that conversation about, maybe it's not rape, but maybe there are other concessions that would be of value to the group. Or you can have a conversation to say, you know, for these dates, our pricing is pretty firm, but if you can flex a day or two or move to a different week or a different time of year, right? If we all have that flexibility, that to me is the biggest benefit of loyalty is being able to have an honest two-way conversation about the partnership and the opportunity at hand there. But I'd love Kelly and Charlene's thoughts on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, yeah, I mean, you're right on Alyssa. It's the relationships that you've built, not only with the hotels directly, with those sales managers, with those CSMs that we're working with all the time, but also for Wells Fargo and our team, it's our GSOs. Um, they play a big role in our ability to place those events that are maybe not quite as desirable. Um, we're able to, you know, work with our GSOs who in turn work with the hotels along with us and just kind of help see a little bit additional insight and we're hopeful that you know the business that we're bringing to the hotel that maybe isn't this program that's a you know tuesday wednesday 10 guest rooms but takes a lot of your space um mm -hmm. that we can eventually work together and maybe find a fit for it even though we know it's not ideal so i think we could all agree that the industry really does boil down to the relationships that you're making and the ability to be flexible on both sides because the hotel wants it to be a win for the group the group wants it to be a win for the group, but also for the hotel. So when we have future needs that you'll take us, right? And it won't be like, oh, we can't work with them for this event. So I would say the relationships, the building, the connections, the on-site relationships that our planners are forming with their CSMs when they're on-site, it all plays a part in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely, Kelly. Um, I used to work for a fellow many years ago and he said, I don't care what industry we're in, we're all in the communication business. <laughs> and that's what it comes down to is having honest communication. I've been, even been on some sourcing calls where my sourcing managers will say, okay, rev par, are you good with your rev par? You know, so it's, it's that empathy with your seat. We understand that you have uh, other people to answer to, uh, not just us as the customer. And then I'll take it a step further inside of Cisco. Uh, in the course of a, a, a calendar year, we might have um, 8,000 different event owners, uh, probably closer to 6,000 actually. But we have to educate them what is going on in the hotel industry. If they have not engaged with us on sourcing and contracting since pre-pandemic, they have no idea of the compression, the speed, the way these um, the, the hotels and the the um, the REITs and everyone is looking at that revenue. So we have to educate on our side and help them understand that the hotel did not have your date, but guess what? They have better dates for you. And and so we are doing a lot of um, education internally with our event owners to help them understand the world out there. Yeah, Charlene, that's a really great point. And, and thank you for bringing it up. I, I can speak for IHG. I'm sure people see our hotels and they assume that they're connected to this big, enormous machine, which they are. But many of our hotels are small businesses and operate as small businesses. And it's really important. Um, of course, you know, we, we want to be able to build those relationships, but that rev par and their financial viability is really important as well. And so it's important to find the pretty baby or the win-win solution that helps us all achieve our goals. Great points, everyone. I promise to take questions throughout, so I'm going to stick to that promise. And we got a question that relates to what we're discussing from Lori. And she's saying that I am seeing a large amount of turndowns due to peak night pattern, even when the hotel has the availability. Is this because there is so much competition for rooms and space that hotels are not open to meeting the request? So I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you, Alyssa. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Kelly kind of uh, touched on it earlier. Obviously, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are, are really peak nights in most of our hotels, whether it's for groups and events or business travel. Um, and it's important to note that just because the hotels may have availability, it might not be the right fit or the right piece of business. So if you have a 100 room hotel and you're trying to take 85 of their rooms on a Wednesday night, that then puts the hotel in a spot where they need to try to fill their Monday, Tuesday and their Thursday, Friday, and they then can't accommodate any of the groups that would stay through. So that supply and demand part is, is really important. And there are teams and technology that we work with on the hotel side to help anticipate that as well. Um, I would hope in that scenario that the hotels are responding with alternate dates or, or some other sort of recommendation. Great. Uh, another question that came through one of this event customer channels um, from Caroline. And she is uh, working as a corporate sales and special events manager for a small venue called Village Suites Bay Harbor, has 30 suites with meeting space. Her question is, how do we connect with the right planners for our unique niche property? Most of the marketing events I go to are for all planners needing 50 or more hotel rooms. So I'll, I'll go to Charlene for that one. I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you're sourcing for smaller meetings that may require some meeting space, how do you find that venue? Um, do you have mm -hmm. any tips for Caroline to uh, connect with planners like yourself? Well, I'll start with CVEN itself. I mean, you have a promotions, you have a showcase feature uh, in that supplier module, and we use that quite a bit. Um, it's, it brings out some things that we might not have thought about and can easily connect with that. Promotions is specifically, we, we love to see that. Um, with smaller properties, I often tell them don't discount the impact of being in a transient program with uh, a, a corporate uh, a corporate America company. Um, when you are included in transient travel, and that is, you know, anyone that's just booking travel a sales, salesperson says, oh, I've got to be in Omaha tomorrow. Let me go through whatever tool you're using, book my travel. And they book their own hotels. And many, many times we get referrals from the salespeople 
who will say to their larger team, hey, I know we're doing an offsite coming up. I just stayed at the wonderful little place. It's small. You're probably not even on your radar, but you're going to love it. And so that will come into our team from that experience on that transient side. Um, and also just reach out. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we love to hear from properties. Um, if we haven't worked with you, we'd love to know more about you because you're proactive and those are the people we love to uh, have our teams work with. So reach out, send us information and I promise I pass it on. I'm, I'm sure others do as well. What about you, Kelly? Any um, advice for Caroline or similar uh, hoteliers in that position of being a smaller yeah. hotel? Sure. Hi, Caroline. I did write down your property, so I will look it up after this call and make sure I know where you are. So if we have meetings there, we'll keep you in mind. Um, it is a tough position to be in. I won't sugarcoat it. It's, it's really hard, especially if you're not branded, if you're not rep by a third party. It is harder to get in front of big corporations, meetings and events team. Um, like Charlene said, reaching out, you know, sending an email, you have you can reach me. I know that my LinkedIn profile has been posted. So as for Wells Fargo, if you contact me, you're covered. And like Charlene, I do share information with all of these, um, with our whole team on these properties that reach out that may be in cities where we're doing business. So we also like to, you know, spend our money locally if we can, and it would be great to know where your property is. So it is hard. Don't underestimate using LinkedIn. Um, if you're in a city where we don't have a big presence, we may have some remote workers there that we could reach out to and say, hey, could you go take a look at this for us? So it is it is harder on your end, no doubt, but don't give up your, uh, your sales drive and reach out to people like everyone on this call and we can, um, you know, just help learn your property and see if it might be a good fit or not. And if it's not a good fit, we'll let you know too. Like, hey, we, we just don't do business in that area. And then you can look into the the transient needs like Charlene said that could be that's another great idea for you. Great answers appreciate that and Caroline hopefully you got what you needed out of those answers. I do want to move on we're getting some great questions in the Q&A uh, area and I wanted to move on because I know earlier we uh, mentioned it was uh, it was Charlene I believe mentioned the pre negotiated contract templates. So Lori also asked another question about those pre-negotiated contract templates. She's wondering, are they chain or hotel specific? Mm -hmm. um, those are um, brand specific. And for the most part, they work. Um, there are some hotels, um, and I see Alyssa smiling, <laughs> that um, we'll choose not to adhere to the pre-negotiated template and that's fine that's fine it, it, you know they are small run businesses and they have their way of doing it but we negotiate that on the brand level and on the global level as much as we possibly can there is still negotiation that happens but we try to restrict that to the business terms not the legal terms mm -hmm. so that helps us do that quicker yeah, absolutely. And that's the way it works at Wells. We have MSAs with several brands. We have different SOWs within those MSAs. So if it's guest rooms only or catering only or a bigger group business, we have different SOWs we use. Just like Charlene at Cisco, we try not to touch those legal terms because those are pre-approved by our legal, by the brand's legal, but we do have full negotiation ability with the business terms. And so um, it's just a great way to do business. I will say that before coming to Wells, I worked for a smaller company with considerably fewer meetings and the MSA just wasn't really a fit. Um, most people, you know, it just wasn't something we did there, but when you're turning contracts and events at the volume that we are, having the MSAs in place with these brands that we know it's safe, we know it's fully vetted is such yeah. a value to our team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On that same topic, Kelly, let's let's keep on talking about contracting. Yeah. Um, how has uh, your contracting process changed, if at all, over the last year or two? Or since 2020? Or since um, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I would say significantly in the fact that we are more cognizant of being extremely clear in our contracting language and making sure both parties 
understand what those cancellation, resale, rebook terms are, what those dollar amounts are, making sure that we under, we're reading that force majeure and making sure it's going to apply. You know, um, the pandemic, that's really no longer a force majeure, but there will be something else. And so it's really brought about this awareness, I think, of those legal terms that, you know, possibly before, you know, 2020, it was not as big of a part of your negotiation. So what I have found, very clear, very concise language, make sure both parties agree. So then when there is a hurricane that's about to hit your event venue, that you know, and everyone's clear and they know what the plan is and they know what's going forward. So I think that's the biggest thing I've seen. And I think that the pandemic really made a lot of hoteliers and uh, buyers just more comfortable with those conversations because it can mm -hmm. happen, right? Before it was like, eh, I don't wanna talk about it. It makes me uncomfortable. I've never been more comfortable canceling contracts now. It's not fun, mm -hmm. but it's easier and everyone's kind of been through it, right? Unless you're just getting into the industry and it'll be new, but it's opened up lines of communication and transparency, I think. What about you, Charlene? Um, how has uh, the contracting process changed? And are, is there anything that you want to point out that specifically has changed and is crucial now to include in the contracts? Well, Kelly, if you were nearby, I would fist bump you <laughs> on making sure cancellation clauses are specific, as detailed as possible. Um, I see some hotel contracts that come through and it's, it's just a, a couple of lines, a couple of sentences. And that's not how we have to operate after coming through a pandemic. So mm -hmm. that has changed a lot. I think we spend more time than we did previous on cash flow in a contract. Cash flow for your hotel, Alyssa, but also cash flow internally for our event owners. You know, when, because uh, we're quarterly budgeted at Cisco, you know, lose it or use it or lose it. And if it's prepaid, the financial people just get uncomfortable. Um, so we try to make sure cash flow is equitable between both parties and is clearly spelled out so we know exactly when the payments are going to be made and for what reason. And force majeure is still, um, while I think, I feel we have a pretty strong force majeure clause. Um, we just did a contract uh, a couple of weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale. So they wanted a specific clause entered about hurricanes. And, you know, that as um, uh, Kelly said, does go back to uh, state and local laws and what that means. And is it, uh, you know, evacuation situation, is it shelter in place? So uh, I think force majeure ha might have sub force majeures now. I think people are looking for specific uh, regional issues. Great. I now want to talk a little bit more about negotiation. Has uh, Charlene, I'll, I'll stick with you. How has the negotiation process been from your perspective? Have you had any best practices in making it, you know, uh, work for you on your side and then also just a smoother process with the hotels? I think everything we've mentioned so far, you know, that sets up a great negotiating opportunity. But I also think we love working with hoteliers that approach it by saying, no, but what about this? Because, you know, just because you and your event owner have a idea of what they want their event to be, the hotel may have a better idea, a better use of that space. And, and so there is a collaboration that happens today. It's not um, a buyer and a seller in my head. It's a collaboration. And honestly, when we come on site, we are both standing across the table from that attendee. So we mm -hmm. are collaborating on site. So why don't we back that up into the negotiating uh, period? So that's what we try to do is, you know, ask the hotel, help us put this event in your hotel. And what about you, Kelly? Any any uh, perspective on negotiation? Well, I mean, the first thought is you're not going to get anything if you don't ask, right? When we're talking about straight hard negotiations, so it's always 
exciting for me, I'll say, when I get a salesperson that is, that understands their business and can come back to me and say, you know, we can't do that. But as Charlene said, what what about this? So I believe that the industry is just all about those relationships and the collaboration. We consider our hotels and all of our vendors partners. You know, we're not just suppliers. They are our partners. I think Charlene, she really did nail it when she said we're both on site. And it's going to reflect if an event goes poorly, they're looking at, you know, the planners are looking at the hotel. So open communication, understanding that we're always going to ask for something and we are built to negotiate. So <laughs> we don't like our partners to feel like we're trying to bowl them over. There is give and take there. So just open communication and mutual respect. I think we've heard communication, collaboration, and flexibility, really, yeah, <laughs> in every single answer that you guys have given. So um, that's great to hear. And then, Alyssa, I know that we mostly have been talking to the event organizer side of uh, this conversation so far. So I wanted to make sure you had a chance to chime in and talk about you know this contracting and negotiating pro negotiation process from the hotel side is there yeah. anything that you've seen change lately and like how are ihg properties adapting to those changes absolutely um when we were talking about msa or msas earlier and sort of discussing between legal terms and business terms and you know what's negotiable negotiable and what's not i thought that was really interesting as well um i know we all signed up to be event planners to be hoteliers maybe some of us are lawyers on the side but i don't know that that would be in any of our like top talents maybe so it's nice to hear what is negotiable and that our partners are willing and able to have those conversations with us um i know there i'm sure there have been scenarios in the past where it feels very us versus them uh, but to charlene's point we're on the same team here and for both parties to to come out on top we need to find a mutually agreeable solution whether that's contracting amenities, rate, on-site experience. So re-establishing that to Charlene's point, right? We're both on the same side of the table. It's in both of our mutual interests for everyone to walk away from this event satisfied, I think can really help shift some paradigms and help us have a better conversation. Absolutely. I do want to take another question um, that came in and it is kind of going back a little bit to a previous conversation we were having about RFPs, and this one's from Lori, and either Kelly or Charlene, or both of you could take this one. When you have a RFP that is getting a lot of turndowns, do you take advantage of the C-Event feature of adding RFP to the marketplace? And it, uh, honestly, Lori, I would think that I asked you to plant this question because uh, we're, we're talking about a C-Event feature that is super helpful. I, it's called RFP Showcase is the tool that I think Lori is referring to. So I'm um, curious, Kelly or Charlene, have you used RFP Showcase and has it worked for you? I have not used that. No, I know. I feel like my next sourcing call with Steven, I'm going to have to have them walk us through that. So no, I have not used that. I think mm -hmm. if I get a lot of turndowns, my first thought is what's going on in the city? Mm -hmm. Why can't I get it? What dates or what location do we need to change to find the right fit? That's my always my initial thought when I see a lot of turndowns on an event. Mm -hmm. we, we have used it. Um, it was a scary moment the first time we used it, and it was coming out of pandemic, right? And you're getting a 30% decline. You've got to get to a contract somewhere, somehow. And we used mark, uh, Marketplace, but it's a showcase. And it worked beautifully. It worked really great for us. The challenge on a corporate side is we have to be very careful about what we share out into the public area for mm -hmm. our events. A lot of our events, um, we, we keep very close uh, control over and we don't want them evangelized. Certainly if it's a customer, uh, come one, come all type event, we can use it. But yeah, we, we do use it, not a lot, but um, it's always in our back pocket. Thank you for that. Um, and then for everyone who does use the C Event Supplier Network, we have a feature called RFP Showcase. If you aren't getting the responses that you need, you can add your RFP to 
this showcase where hotels and venues can um, bid on the business based on the requirements and them being an excellent fit for the business. So it just opens up your uh, pool of hotels and venues to more than you actually send the RFP to. So it's a great way to for hotels to win more business and for planners to expand their reach to maybe hotels and venues they didn't consider, but are still a good fit for the business. Is um, it all so, in the same city that you're sourcing, Kelly? Or can yes. you use, use, okay. Yes, same city. Yep. Yeah, and I think too, if I put myself in the, the event planner seat for that as well, the perk is that everyone who's bidding from that RFP showcase has availability. So it's not like you're sending it out to 10 more properties and getting whatever the stats were earlier, 50% turned down. Um, those are people who are willing and able and coming with a compelling offer to sort of throw their hat in the ring there. So we've seen some success with it at IHG and it's been a great feature. Great, great to hear. This hour is going by so fast. I want to make sure that we get into talking about room block management a little bit. And there's some really good questions that came through too in the chat. So I want to get to those. So let's talk a little bit more about room block management. We talked about rooming lists a little bit previously, but now um, let's get into kind of what uh, it, the experience has been for our panel. I'll start with you, Charlene. What have attendance levels been like at events? And have you struggled filling room blocks? Um, and then is there any attrition? Have you struggled with that as well? I remember attrition. It's not a word I use now. Uh, we are very fortunate at Cisco over the last 12 months, maybe a little bit longer. Um, attendance is up. If anything, I'm doing change orders to contracts to add more rooms. So I think it's, there's an ebb and flow to all of that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, now that we're all traveling again, I think the more attractive events, you know, the events that have an experience attached to them. So from a marketing standpoint, I think we are driving more attendance and uh, there is less risk with those uh, attrition situations. It does happen. Um, but uh, we, we try uh, not to overcommit and understand. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're, we're on some events, uh, we're doing overflow hotels, which we've never done before. So uh, except for our big flagships, but even for smaller ones, we're doing overflow. So um, yay. <laughs> Sounds like a great problem to have. And then Kelly, do you have any perspective on, uh, on this topic? Yeah, I will say the way our structure is at Wells Fargo, I don't, the sourcing team doesn't often get called in for attrition situations. I haven't heard of a lot. I know that I often do get a request for an overflow block, but I, I know it's happening, you know, across the, the border or the, you know, across the spectrum there. I will say one thing on our end is we see a lot of changes, a lot of bank changes themselves that result in hey, we're going to add this 50-person meeting onto your other 50-person meeting that's already booked. So find us that space and find us more rooms at the same hotel. So we work with our hotel partners very closely and do the best we can to make those dreams of our business partners come true. But I will say just, I know you can't always, hotels can't always have that flexibility. So we do the best that we can, but we send an RFP out it's as complete as it possibly can be at that time. We give as much information, but just so the hoteliers on the phone know, it does change a lot. We have business partners changing their mind. They move positions within the bank. A new regulation is passed. So when we come back to you, it's just like my blanket apology in advance. We're doing the best we can to get you the most accurate information, but there will be changes coming from us at least. I think we can all agree that Room block management is is a pain point on both sides of the equation, the event organizer side, and then of course the hotel side. So uh, Alyssa, when IHG works with event organizers on room blocks, what strategies are, are you seeing from the hotels to make that a little bit easier and to make it just a little bit more streamlined for both sides? Yeah, absolutely. It definitely can be a, a clunky process at times. Um, we do have some of our hotels that use the passkey tool, so that definitely helps in this process. And then we also have some hotels that still rely on whatever our, our planners prefer, whether that's an Excel spreadsheet or some other way that they communicate that information. 
I think where we see things go awry is when, and this isn't roomingless specific, but everything specific, when there's multiple versions of the same document or we're not all working from the single source of truth, um, that leads to those challenges or can lead to those challenges that we talked about at the, the top of the call, right? With people being in the wrong room or dates being incorrect or a reservation being missed uh, entirely. So I think the more clearly we can communicate and like Kelly said, there's always changes. We know that there's changes on our side as well. Um, but if we can just be clear in either what the changes are or how we're communicating them, I think that sets all of us up for a, a more successful event. Great. Before we get to some questions in the, the Q&A area, hopefully we have about five minutes to answer those. There was one question submitted from uh, Rachel in New Jersey, and this one I think Alyssa can address the best. We have an issue of hierarchy, ensuring certain executives and guests are placed in better rooms higher floors. It becomes a whole to do. What's the best way to assess your room options and availabilities in place as appropriate? Thanks, Kelly. And hi, Rachel. I'm from New Jersey as well. So happy to hear from you. Um, this is potentially an uncomfortable topic, but I'm sure at, at all of your companies, you've got a sort of hierarchy um, of people who are attending the event. And I think to be really clear on this person is priority one, this person is priority two, this person is priority three, um, that helps the hotel to ensure that the right people get that special service or get that welcome amenity or, or enhanced room. Um, but if we just get a list of 20 people and it's up to the hotel to decide who gets what, that's, I think, where this sort of miscommunication or misalignment of expectations comes in. But I love Kelly and Charlene's thoughts on, on how they handle this as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the ranking. I don't typically do that as part of my role, but that makes complete sense to me. If we're not clear on who needs to be, you know, top of the list, how can we expect the our hotel partners to be? Right, right. We absolutely rank our executives and whether they ever see it, they probably <laughs> never, ever see it. But we know who is, if they're both VPs, we know which one you need to service first. Um, and so we absolutely provide that. And then we ask you, if we're not on site, to notify us if you have deviated, because we might have some management we need to do with that executive. But yes, you got to rank them. Yep. Yeah, I, I love when you said it just reminds me, I used to have a CEO that was very excited anytime American Airlines upgraded him. I'm like, of course they did. And then you can have you know, but he was just blown away. So he would be a low maintenance type of person, right? But then you might have someone who's like, there's peanuts in my room and I don't like peanuts. <laughs> so the ranking is very important. All right, I am going to now move to the Q&A uh, questions that didn't really fit into our conversation, but we definitely wanna get to them if we have the time. Um, so I'll, I'll close us out though, because I know that um, we also have a link that will be put into the chat for a $100 Amazon gift card. And what you need to do is fill out um, the form to get a demo with us to receive that gift card. So if you're interested, uh, make sure you click on that link or copy that link in the chat and fill out that form. All right, let's get into some of the questions. And I'm gonna kind of hop around because I saw some very interesting ones that I personally wanted to um, hear the answers to. And that first one is um, for Charlene. How do you provide the education to the event owners of, of the current landscape when the MRF is submitted or is this an ongoing campaign? Is this part of your SMMP? Uh, yes, it is a uh, part of our SMM and we do it year round. We have a sh internal SharePoint site where we post tips and tricks, uh, but we absolutely do it when we're contacted to go out for RFP for an event. We have developed a great little slide and you can develop your own. Uh, ours says is 30 days enough. And we walk through the timeline from when we receive the request and how long does it take for you to get sign up from your executive, your financial people? And then the hotel has their timeline. And so what we show them is 30 days is not enough. I mean, you're, you need to be much more proactive if you want to work through this in a calm, <laughs> less stressed fashion. But we had to graphically show it. So I would encourage you to do that. Post it somewhere so everyone sees it all the time. 
I'm going to move on to that top ranked question here because I think we all probably could answer this one. For those who are new to event management within a larger organization, what tools and resources would you recommend for a team to access to learn more about the event management planning expertise? from Brienne Arnott. So I think that a lot of our experts have been in the industry for quite a while, but I'm sure you have members of your team who are who are newer and maybe want to learn a little bit more about um, the industry. So I'm, I'm curious what you all recommend. Yeah, I think, you know, we have brand new planners at Wells as well, and we encourage them to have to set up one on one calls with not only the sourcing individuals at Wells Fargo, but other planners that have been here a while. So asking for mentorship mentee opportunities, I think, is huge. And if it is a bigger company, they should have something in place where you can apply for such a program. I would look into that. I also think industry events are a big way to learn more. Cvent Connect is coming up is it end of June, I believe. Anything like that, they have regional events that you can attend just to learn more about the industry. Networking with people, I think, is a, a big part of what you need to do when you're starting out. You're going to get, you're going to find people that you can ask these questions to. I'm happy to answer questions for you, too. Again, feel free to reach out to me directly, but just meeting people and boots on the ground experience is really going to help. So get, in, get into those event spaces, get to those meetings and see how things work, and you'll just build your you know, your expertise as the years go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I'll say the same networking, um, read everything that you can find, read every trade magazine that is out there, attend as much as you can in the industry. Uh, and, and internally, one of the things we do is uh, stretch assignments. So if yeah. you have an interest of being on another event, uh, put your hand up, contact them and say, hey, I'd like to learn how to do what you do can I volunteer and help you along the way? So we are always pleased with that. Great. And I just want to echo Cvent Connect June 10th to the 13th, because that is a great way to um, get information based on all levels of, of event organizers and hotels. There are sessions for everyone and education and training opportunities and a lot of networking too, which is great um, for our industry. And unfortunately, I think we have to end with that question, but I will make sure that we get written answers to everyone who has a pending question in uh, the question and answer area, because I did not realize that we were going to get so much engagement from the audience, but it has been great. And I hope that this was valuable for everyone who joined us. And then I just want to thank again, our our panelists, I think we could do uh, ask us anything session next time and not even have any questions um, that I prepared because we had so many good questions come in. You guys are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you again so much for joining us, Kelly, Alyssa, and Charlene. It was great. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.